Party people, Tony Rowe here, and today we are talking Smith Mora. In my, let's see, book 2014, something like that, I, in order to save pages, recommended the following transposition. So after e4, c5, d4, this is sort of like the starting of the Smith Mora gambit. C takes D4, C3. Now, accepting the Smith Moore Gambit would be D takes C3. That's what we're going to talk about today. In my book, I recommended three knight F6, E5, knight D5, because uh, I was closing in on 500 pages, and frankly, I was already recommending knight F6 against the Alapin, and this seemed like a prudent and practical thing to do to save space. But in a way, it has always sort of eaten me up inside because I generally accept the Smith Moore Gambit. And so here we are. I'm rectifying that situation right now. And so, yeah, for those of you who are not familiar with the scourge of many club players, uh, the, the Smith Moore Gambit goes as follows D4, C3, D takes C3, and now Knight takes C3. And White's point is, of course, that for the cost of a pawn, white has gotten this move for free and has very easy and free development. Bishop c4, knight f6, this dark squared bishop is ready to, to go as well as a consequence of white removing the d-pawn from d2, and also these open d and c files. And practically, it can be a dangerous weapon. And so it, it is worth talking about how to deal with the smith Moore Gambit. And um, before we get too far, I, I think it's uh, important for me to talk about the fact that I don't think the smith Moore Gambit is bad or that bad. Like, some people think it's, it's terrible, it's refuted. Some people think it's just as good as the Open Sicilian. I'm probably somewhere in between. I think White probably has reasonable compensation in all lines, or, you know, maybe maybe someday we'll find one where black has a tiny advantage somewhere, but I doubt it's easy. I mean, listen, on some level, white is just down a pawn, and a lot of times being down just a clean pawn is not enough to lose, and it's obvious that white has some compensation for it here. Um, and so I, I think that you have to view it like, at least how like I view all openings these days, it, more openings have are playable in 2022 than ever before. And so your goal, in my opinion, is not to find an advantage for white or necessarily uh, to find like super clean equality as black. You need to just find something that's playable that uh, expected value wise you score well with. And so that's what I'm providing you guys today. I'm providing you guys a system where if white plays perfectly, white will have enough compensation to be equal but it's not easy and this system overall uh the so-called taylor system scores very well especially with uh the fact that most club players want to play the smith more like a system okay and what i mean by that is i was talking to a friend my, my buddy paul about this and, and he pointed out that the smith more gambit in itself is kind of like a system like the london and so let's just take our moves, knight c6, knight f3, d6, bishop c4, and now we're going to go a6. This is the Taylor system. Uh, named after Tim Taylor, who wrote a book in, I think, maybe 1993, sometime in the 90s, called beating the, something like beating the Smith Moore Gambit with 6a6 or whatever. But the system point is that basically all Smith Moore Gambit Gambit players want to go knight f3, knight c3, bishop c4, castles, queen e2, Rook D1, and they want to smash you with E5. They want to line up the Rook with your Queen, and they want to open lines while they have this lead in development, and they just want to lop your head off. And that's why it's it's sort of a system in a way, because most club players are not playing the Smith Mora Gambit in a very nuanced way. They just want to play the same moves over and over again. And this specific system, the Taylor system, is very good at crushing people that want to play it that way. And I'll, I'll show you why in, in, in a bit, but uh, first, why a6? Very great question, because it's sort of an odd looking move when you think about it. There are probably three or four other very 
normal looking development moves besides a6 the point is that we really want to go knight f6 and even further we're specifically delaying e6 which is a very popular move against the smith mora blunting the bishop stopping knight d5 getting ready for like bishop e7 knight e6 knight f6 excuse me we're specifically delaying e6 such that we can possibly go bishop g4 in the future and we cannot do this right away because you get blown out and uh, we also cannot go knight f6 right away because after e5 uh, first things first, you cannot take this way. This would be a tremendous mistake after this here and here. Of course, because this is a nice little deflection from d8. Not advised. We must take here. Uh, but then this is uh, a rather annoying little initiative. White has worked up. And so, so we play a6 specifically to be able to go knight f6 on the next move. So we go a6 and white castles generally castles there are two other moves bishop g5 and e5 that in order to keep this video reasonable length i will just refer you to the study as usual i have more stuff in the study than i than i talk about in the video and you can check out that study in the link down below bishop g5 was uh hans langrock's original recommendation in his mora book a long time ago it doesn't really hold up anymore and e5 was something that i first came across in a simultaneous exhibition against alex lenderman on the icc so that's how old this move is uh the icc was still relevant and uh it suffices to say that e6 is the best move here i'll just show you because it's kind of adorable if you play this way again you can't take with the knight because you get blown out um, by this, so that's a very typical smith Moore tactic you just need to know, but if you take this way, uh, queen takes d8, knight takes d8, knight d5, threatening very naughty, knight c7, knight e6, stopping it, knight b6, hitting here, hitting here, knight b, uh, rook b8, only move, knight e5, knight f6, and now the, uh, very pretty tactical shot, knight takes f7, exclam king takes f7 and then the quiet follow-up bishop f4 trapping the rook boy <laughs> um so that's the that's the point of of e5 but if you simply don't take it and you go e6 i think black is better there but generally white castles okay and we then follow up with the intended knight f6 and we've reached sort of the main tabia of the Taylor system. And so white has quite a few moves here, and it's worth going through the ones that are not as good. Wow. I always do that, guys, don't I? Just, you know, rewind all the chapters tone. Okay, so e4, c5, cd, c3, d takes c3, knight takes c3, knight c6, knight f3, d6, bishop c4, a6, castles, knight f6, and uh, let's see, let's check the lead chess database really quick. So overwhelmingly popular, two to one versus anything else is the move queen e2. This move is just a straight up mistake, in my opinion. It's been labeled dubious. It's been labeled nothing. Depending on what literature you check, I think this move kind of stinks. <clears throat> but let's take a look at, at uh, some of the other moves first. Let's at least take a look at e5. This move does not work now. So d takes e5. You must take this way. And after queen takes d8, knight takes d8. Uh, now that we have knight f6 in, there is no knight d5 uh, to b6 like the Lenderman line. Uh, e5 earlier. White just has to take here. And I think the best move is probably bishop e6. Threatening to trade and dealing with the threat against possible threat against f7. And after bishop e2, I think g6 is the best move. And we're just going to go bishop g6, bishop g7, excuse me, after g6, castles, and then look to trade off pieces, perhaps with knight d7, knight c6, perhaps rook c8 first, then knight c6, knight d7, or knight d5. Just trying to lop off a set of minor pieces or so, and I think black is just up a pawn for mostly nothing. The most common move here, um, like I said, is queen e2, and this is 
probably if you just pay attention to one line, if you want to fight against the Smith Moore Gambit, this is the most important one because this is the one that people play the most. And this is again the system approach, and also again the move that uh, the Taylor system is really meant to stop. And we've been playing sort of almost in this maximalist style where we're not willing to block in the light squared bishop yet. There are, there are tons of systems against the Smith Moore where you just play e6 immediately because it stunts the bishop, it stops knight d5, etc. But we've been waiting basically to go knight f6 and bishop g4, and here. Uh, it's no exception. And the point is, is, of course, now we're ready to go e6, but it's very hard for white to get in e5 now with the bishop on g4 pinning the knight to the queen. Furthermore, uh, this pin is annoying enough that even though white has played queen e2, at some point white might have to go h3 to break the pin, and after bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, White has sort of lost a tempo going queen e2 to queen f3. And so that's why I think this, this queen e2 move is kind of bad. Because here there are better waiting moves that allow bishop g4, but don't waste a tempo in, in the event that black takes on f3. But queen e2 is the most important move, so let's look at it. Bishop g4, rook d1. Again, according to the system. <clears throat> and again, in this specific position, threatening e5. Now d takes e5 would not be possible, and knight takes e5 can be met by knight takes e5 because bishop takes e2, bishop takes f7 is checkmate. Okay, we go e6, and now e5 is stopped because knight takes e5, knight takes e5 does not come with any threat anymore. And the most popular move here is bishop f4, which again, I think is a mistake. Again, very consistent. Looking to possibly go e5 again, or at least start ganging up on the backward d6 pawn. Uh, but it's bad. It, it used to be that I would play the move queen b8 in this position, which is the most popular move in the database. It's also not a bad move. You can see uh, on the evaluation bar that Lee Chess Stockfish still thinks that black is better. And the point is, after something like h3, bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, bishop e7, black has the e5 uh, break, pretty much completely locked down, it's not gonna happen. And pressure on the backward d6 pawn can be uh, nullified via knight to e5, blocking, blocking the dark squared bishop. And this queen b8, even if it's not the move here, is also just an extremely useful move to understand in the Taylor defense. We are removing, whoop, we are removing the queen from the d file, which unpins the d pawn in the event of e5, and we are also adding a an attacker to the e5 square, preparing knight e5 if need be. And of course, <clears throat> queen c7 might seem more natural, of course, because it does not block this rook in, but the queen is vulnerable along the c file. And that's no bueno. Like, for instance, knight d5 might be a threat after bishop b3, where e takes d5, e takes d5 would expose... Uh, this nasty pin along along the C file. So queen b8, very important move to understand, very strong move. Here it's still good. Stockfish gives this almost uh, a full pawn to black's cause, so it doesn't think white has very much at all. But there's a much stronger move after bishop h5, a bishop f4, and that move is knight h5, excuse me. Uh, and the point is, is that white can no longer stop knight e5, after which we are going to take on f3 and wreck white's pawn structure okay and so the main move pretty much the only move white's ever played is bishop e3 going back and now knight e5 and this position scores tremendously well uh <clears throat> both uh bishop e3 is is pretty much the only move really worth talking about and uh black scores over 75 75 percent in the lead chess database um and there are Actually, many good approaches here. People recommend queen f6. Uh, I don't think that's the best move. Bishop e7 is very good, planning to basically go bishop takes f3, g takes f3, bishop g5, after which you can just install one of these pieces onto f4 and swing the queen over to g5, h4 with a pretty massive kingside initiative. Like, for instance, I in, in the study, I give uh, bishop a4 check, king f8. Uh... 
king h1 for instance takes takes and then g5 i think you could probably also go bishop g5 <clears throat> very good for black there's also the probably the more ambitious move which is bishop takes f3 g takes f3 queen h4 which stockfish just thinks is minus three for black it's already just completely winning and yeah as you can see here the point is queen to h3 and knight takes f3 check would which would force white to give up the queen to stop the mate on h2 for instance, if, it were, if black was allowed to make two moves, you go queen h3, knight takes f3 check, king h1, only move, queen takes h2 mate. That's pretty bad. And actually, these lines, man, when I was analyzing this position, these lines are sort of unbelievable. I mean, I, I bring up bishop e7 and queen f6 because those are easier moves to play, really. Like, they're not as complicated. But these, these lines after, after queen h4, you just have to see some of them. So I'm going to show them to you oops, and, and waste some time here, but they're just so good from just an attacking chess perspective. Okay, so let's look at king h1 first. And this move has been played uh, the most. Uh, and the point is, is that white just wants to be able to go rook g1, rook g2 to stop uh, mate on the h2 square. And black goes queen h3, rook g1. And now this absolutely fantastic move g5 double x clam and the point is if, if you just go here then white goes here and it's actually not that clear um especially because like these bishop a4 b5 knight takes b5 a takes b5 queen takes b5 sacks come in and and black has to go king e7 then queen d7 or uh, queen d7 check black has to go king f6 it starts getting real weird here um and so black has to be kind of precise and this g5 move is uh just tremendously sick uh in a way like for instance <clears throat> if bishop g5 then very quiet move h6 and if bishop back to e3 we discover the point after knight takes f3 rook g2 there's the sack rook g8 when of course this is impossible because of this but if not that, then what? Because I'm also threatening mate here. So white pretty much has to go uh, queen f1. And then there's another fantastic move here, rook g4. When again, you can't take because of this mate. But also, how do you stop rook h4? Queen takes h2, rook takes h2, rook takes h2 mate. So pretty unbelievable um, attacking motif. Similarly, after g5, rook g5, same basic problem, knight takes f3, threatens the, both the rook this time and this mate. There you go here. Let me fix that, yeah. You go back, rook g2, forced, and then rook g8, same thing. Queen f1, rook g4, same problem. Pretty beautiful. And uh, I'd encourage you guys to analyze these positions a little bit more. There's also a very, a very humorous line here. So we've gone bishop takes f3, g takes f3, queen h4 again, and there's bishop a4 check. When we go b5, white must must continue the attack. If you just retreat, there was no point. We just go queen h3, you get blown out. So white must go into this and can snag the, the a rook if, if, if white so chooses. Queen h3, threatening mate in two. King h1, only move. Knight f3, and then white has to go for this sort of desperado attack after bishop b, d4 check. There's nothing else e5 bishop takes e5 d takes e5 queen d8 check bishop e7 hanging the other rook of course you can't take it but rook d6 check pretty beautiful <laughs> utilizing this pin now there's this check okay king g5 queen e7 f6 and only check left we don't take king h6 and White runs out of gas. Rook g2, only move. Knight h4 uh, effectively ends the resistance. Because let's say white just moves the rook somewhere. Queen f3 check. He must go. Like, let's say rook g1. Queen f3 check. Rook back to g2. <laughs> Queen takes g2, mate. And uh, there are prettier motifs. Like, let's say... I mean, rook g4 is ridiculous, but it is possible. There's there's queen f3. Um, 
rook g1, knight g3, because fg allows this, and uh, hg instead allows queen h3 with a beautiful smothered main. So pretty pretty unbelievable lines, actually, <laughs> in, the, in this. But again, I, I only mention these because uh, it's sort of important to know kind of what's going on after this, but also just know that you're pretty much winning af uh, after, you know, queen h3. It's just, it's not easy to prove. And, that, and again, that's why I, I mentioned uh, the other moves, queen f6, bishop e7, because if you want to chicken out, you can play, instead of knight h5, you can play queen b8 here, and after knight h5, bishop e3, uh, knight e5, bishop b3, you can also just play bishop e7 here or queen f6. But okay, that that that's most of what you need to know after queen to e2. It is it is important. I should mention that after uh queen e2, e6, bishop h4 is is a mistake after knight h5. It is possible for white to go h3 here instead and then we sort of are compelled to to play like this and after bishop f4 again there's this very key move queen b8. And I do think that black is pretty clearly better here. Uh, there are three examples in the, the study I cover g4, queen d3, and rook d2. I'll just go over one of those. Rook d2 is the, the most straightforward. And again, you just really have to remember this, this thematic 95 idea. Because after rook a to d1, uh, 95, most precise. If you go rook d8 here... Um, that that's also possible, I guess. I, I think at some point, like for instance, if white goes, like, uh, well, yeah, maybe maybe rook d8 here is fine. In a lot of positions, you don't have that option. You must go knight e5. So it's just I think useful to just remember knight e5 in general. But um, yeah, another idea worth mentioning is that there's always it because you play queen b8. It, it can be a little tricky to unravel your your queenside major pieces, but there's always this idea of going b5, um, and it's even possible possible here to go queen b7, but b5, and then this idea of queen b7, where you've connected rooks, and also you are double attacking white's e4 pawn, which becomes a real threat after b4, knight a4, like queen e4, for instance, so. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think that's it. So there's basically uh, when you reach this position, there's bishop f4 to review, knight h5, and then bishop e3, knight e5. When we chop here, go queen h4, queen h3, or uh, just h3, bishop f3, queen f3, bishop e7, bishop e4, bishop f4, excuse me, and then the very important queen b8. And that's really all you need to know after queen e2. And so so you got to ask yourself like, okay, what's the next evolution then if queen e2 is not very good? Uh, and it's probably h3. Immediately planning to go queen e2 without allowing bishop g4. And in this position, are we doing time-wise? 23 minutes. In this position, we just go e6. So this is sort of the other style of pawn structure you can play here. It looks exactly like a Schaveningen, for instance. Um, except that the c file is open and blacks up a pawn, <laughs> sort of. Um, whites up a move, the c file is open, blacks up a pawn. There are some weird idiosyncrasies because usually the knight's on d4 in an in a open Sicilian, and here it's on f3, but in general, queen e2, bishop e7, rook d1. And uh, there are a lot of moves here. I, I started out a long time ago playing bishop d7, blocking the, the pin, because uh, this was what was, was recommended in Gallagher's book on the anti-Sicilians. And after bishop f4, the idea is to go b5, bishop b3, and then again queen b8. But here, white is in time to go e5, and then stuff gets like, uh, oops, knight e5, just to keep my notes consistent, takes, takes, bishop e5. And yes, he, here things get kind of hairy after bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, and then... Not knight d5, which I think is okay after bishop d8. I think black is probably better there, but knight e4 is kind of annoying. And, of course, we don't want to allow this. And also castling and allowing this is quite risky because of how quickly the, the minor pieces swing over. And so bishop e7 is natural. Stopping this and stopping this. But then queen d2 is annoying. And the point is you still can't castle because this thing is hanging. And you can't really go here because of this check. And you still can't castle 
you can't go here because this hangs and rook a to c1 is a very serious threat so this is sort of not to be recommended in a way anymore i think it's um it's better if we go back h3 e6 queen e2 bishop e7 rook d1 you can either start with b5 or queen c7 queen c7 is maybe a little bit more natural and then after bishop f4 again we go knight e5 same old stuff we're hitting the the bishop bishop b3 and then castles uh rook a to c1 and then again queen b8 and i think um black has a good position here it seems to me like most people have decided that the only real plan white has for whipping up uh compensation or trying to whip up compensation is the slow idea of going knight d4 bishop g3 and then f4 because otherwise you know without a pawn break you have no real plan and so white is forced to remove <coughs> excuse me forced to remove two two different pieces from the f file to uh to play f4 f5 or f4 e5 and so we have a little bit of time here like for instance knight d4 bishop d7 bishop g3 and then i think knight c6 preempting f4 is is um probably a little bit better for black and people have tried knight c6 bishop c6 e5 de bishop e5 uh queen e8 this is all pretty much forced and black is ready for rook d8 i think black is just better here white has very little compensation or after knight c6 knight f3 instead trying to keep the pieces on but uh it's funny because because of this shuffle of knight f3 d4 back to f3 after like b5 e5 takes 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 queen b7 we actually reach a position very similar to the one i talked about from the gallagher book except that the moves rook c1 and castles are inserted and that is very convenient for black of course because i think in general rook c1 while not a bad move is not useful relative to castles so like for instance here bishop takes bishop takes knight e4 doesn't really do anything because we've already castled knight d5 doesn't do anything either so yeah i think black is is better here generally and those are the the general breakdown just to, to review real quick of the white's suboptimal eighth moves let's put it that way so after queen e2 we go bishop g4 and white has uh rook d1 e6 and then either bishop f4 or h3 there black is better in both cases or h3 immediately after which we go into just e6 bishop e7 um sort of solid stuff with queen c7 knight e5 okay and so like the final evolution in this line where i think you know theory is pretty much landed as white being okay is to go is for white to go bishop f4 instead and again i presume i'm in, i'm i'm all the way at the end of my line cuz why not but okay so we we go all the way back and yeah so this is this bishop f4 move is probably the best move and it it's it was recommended both by esserman i lost his name for a second in mayhem with the uh, mayhem in the mora which is like the the smith mora bible and also in hans Langrock's second edition of the modern Mora Gambit. And the point is, is actually relatively simple. Bishop f4 in these structures is a useful move, as we've seen. That tends to be the square where the dark squared bishop goes. Um, and so white plays that first and delays queen e2 because after bishop g4 now, white can go h3 and on bishop f3, queen f3, white would be up a full tempo on on lines we've already discussed right so we just don't have e6 in here relative to other variations and of course that is uh not that great for us now i i will say that this is how bad the other lines are that we can go e6 here and i think generally it's okay it's just trickier um so white would still go rook fd1 here and the problem which i've run into in more than one uh Blitz game on Lee Chess by now is that if we go same thematic queen b8, there's this there's this very funny move, bishop e2. And the point is that, of course, now knight e5 does not hit it. It's no longer there. But also white is ready to exploit the extra tempo that they have by going queen g3, which both 
makes it tricky for us to develop the dark square bishop. Or if we have developed the dark square bishop, it hits g7, and it also hits uh, d6, and it also possibly prepares e5, and the bishop on e2 stops us from going queen g3, knight h5, winning uh, the bishop pair and stopping the whole plan, you know, protecting g7 and winning the f4 bishop by, of course, just covering the square. And this is quite annoying, and even, even worse is that, like, after something like bishop e7, bishop g3, castles... We typically would just be like, okay, just take the freaking pawn. Um, I will simplify the position, and after I bring a, a rook to d8, I'll be fine. The problem is that white can go rook d6, and uh, this is actually pretty terrifying. If you take it, takes queen a7, and white doesn't even have to take back. They can just go e5, pushing uh, your last defender away from the king side, rook d1. And white has a pretty massive uh, attack here. I think black can probably defend, like, you know, Stockfish would defend this against you, probably. But um, in human games, I would not recommend uh, trying this. And in fact, in the only game that I've had on Lee Chess that reached this exact position, I was dead lost very quickly. Uh, I managed to win, but I was just straight up lucky. I was getting killed. And so I, I would not recommend doing this. If you want to play this way after bishop g4... Uh, h3, bishop f3, queen f3, e6, rook fd1, I would recommend instead queen to a5. And if white plays in the same way with bishop e2, queen e7, I believe in this quite a bit less than if the queen is on b8, because at the very least, uh, white is not gaining a tempo on the queen. Like, for instance, um... Queen g3 is uh, Langrock's suggestion, but I, I'm not sure I believe it anymore. Um, for instance, this now is just met by this, which is... Er, no, here we just take, and then, then we can, I think, move the rook, and, and this is not that bad in this, in this specific case, like here, for instance, and, and we're defending. Um, here, yeah, here... Rook d6 could be met by e5, which is somewhat unpleasant for white. They might have to chuck here, and then we have this in-between move. And we're just much better after this. <clears throat> just up in a clean exchange with this uh, pretty pretty baller knight on d4. Um, in instead, uh, I'm losing myself in my notes here. Yeah, Langrock goes queen g3. And then a3, which I, I'm not sure I believe in at all after knight e5, frankly. b4, queen c7, rook a to c1, queen b8, and I think um, black is generally yeah, okay here. Rook c8 is fine. <clears throat> We've avoided most of the terrible things that can happen anyway. Um, and uh, instead, if if white just decides to to chop all the stuff off, then we just uh, chop off a bunch of heavy pieces on the D file and are not much worse, let's put it, or, or, or worse at all, really. But uh, I think perhaps after bishop f4, it's actually just easier to play e6 and and recognize that, that um, perhaps this plan is no longer, the bishop g4 plan is no longer as exciting when white has not played queen e2. And so, so instead of being a tempo down on the other lines, it, it might be better to just develop quickly with e6 instead. And after queen e2, now that we can't go bishop g4, white is happy to go queen e2 and start, start to arrange e5 again. And I think the best move is knight h5. And this move is not mentioned, as far as I can tell, by either Esserman or Langrock. I will confess, though, that I only have uh, Esserman's book on my phone. And it's very hard to navigate that book on forward chess because the chapters are very odd. And then when when you're on forward chess, they're they're sort of split up in a weird way. And listen, so um, Mark, if I if I'm claiming that you missed this move and you didn't, and it's somewhere weird, that's on me, man. Um, <laughs> but basically, we're just playing knight h5. We're kicking the bishop off the the diagonal, and then we're just going to continue development like normal. Bishop e7, rook f d1. And here, because e5 is not possible and d6 is not that weak, I think it's probably best to just go bishop d7 and, and develop your pieces. You don't have to do something like queen b8 yet. And 
White has tried uh, a couple of different moves here. I don't think that uh, white is tremendously worse, but it's it's also not that difficult for black to play either. Like um, one thing to consider, e5 is not very good. People have tried it because uh, they want to they want to go go here and maybe knight b6, hitting uh, the rook and the newly opened exposed bishop on d7. But knight f4 is quite annoying. And if queen d2, then knight d5, sacking the pawn back, but uh, grabbing the bishop pair is quite nice. Bishop e6, and black should be fine. For instance, queen e4, queen a5, and we're ready to meet bishop b6 with either queen b5 or queen b4. So this is this is kind of comfy. And again, black is still up a pawn and has a bishop pair. You just really got a castle. Not to be recommended for white. Rook a c1 is also possible. Again, relatively simple moves. Bishop f4, and now we should just go e5. And this is kind of uh, not totally thematic. Bishop g5. White's looking to get into this weak, weak d5 square. This looks very much like a Kalashnikov, actually, except that uh, black is up a pawn. It, it's probably a very reasonable Kalashnikov for white, but... Um, yeah, we're up a pawn. Listen, and and again, the, white has some positional pressure, but we're not getting checkmated. We have equal space in the center. Like it's not easy for white to win the pawn back. We just might have to grovel for a little while. And uh, the only game I could find continued as such. Again, white dominates the d5 square, but this position actually is not so bad. Again, we're up a pawn. We have the two bishops. D4 is a possible weakness for white. Maybe we go knight a5 in the future. Um, not too bad. It also is possible after rook a to c1 castles, bishop b3, knight f6, bishop f4, e5, to go bishop g4. And this move might be even better, just looking to, to go here. The engine actually thinks that white should abandon the bishop g5, takes f6 plan, and just go back to e3, which maybe points to bishop g4 being a better move. But yeah, so two options. Um, the most popular move after rook fd1, bishop d7, is knight d4, hitting the knight, centralizing this knight. And not to be recommended is the most obvious move, knight f6, because knight c6. Uh, you can't go bishop c6 because of e5, because of this pin. That would be very unfortunate. You must go b takes c6, and then bishop a6 wins the pawn back. So that's no good. We must go g6. But again, no real problems. Now, after knight takes c6, we can go bishop takes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, e5 here is not very good. We can... Um, just move the queen, I think, for the most part. Like something like queen c7 would be probably better for black because after e takes d6, bishop takes d6. Sorry, my eyes are burning right on time. Um, yeah, the the e4, e5, e takes d6 didn't really do anything. It, you kind of opened up lines, but uh, now h2 is hanging and black doesn't have any real problems. I'm tearing up at how good this coverage of the, <laughs> the Smithmore Gambit is. Okay, we're almost done, folks. Okay, so instead, knight d4, g6, knight takes c6, bishop takes c6, bishop h6. Kind of annoying, except for the fact that bishop g5 um, trades off the bishops. And now we're kind of like relatively harmoniously placed. White wins the pawn back, king e7, but rook fd8, and this pretty cleanly equalizes. I think in the game, white chopped everything off, and um, yeah, no real problems for black. Knight f4 is coming, queen c1 is, is possible, and with all of the, with two minor pieces and all the heavy pieces exchanged except the queen, it's not really all that relevant that black's king is on the d8 square. So yeah, equality, and uh, maybe I would even kind of prefer black here, I'm not sure. But yeah, I, I don't think uh, huge winning chances for either side. This was S. Otteson, uh, J. Hansen Correspondence 2021, so a relatively fresh, high-level correspondence game. To end things off yeah and that's really uh all you need to know to start capturing on c3 in the smith mora gambit and i think that if you guys pick up the taylor defense out here uh just very quickly to review know what to do against this know that this is you know very strong <clears throat> know to maybe meet bishop f4 with e6 and uh, i think you guys are set honestly like uh 
I have uh, a pretty solid score against Smith Morigamba using this line. And in updating my theoretical knowledge, I actually didn't even know about Knight H5 in that position, this, this position here. Yeah, I've been playing Queen B8 for, for a long time. And I also uh, learned a lot about how to play against the more advanced Bishop F4 move, uh, Esserman and Langrock's recommendation. So it, it was great for me to update my theoretical knowledge here. And I hope that you guys also score really well against the Smith Morrow Gambit. Let me know in the comments if uh, you you watch this video and you run into the Smith Morrow Gambit how the games go. Uh, again, if you like these videos, you dig these long form uh, opening videos, uh, like the video, comment, subscribe. If you want, donate, keep the channel going. Much appreciated, guys. I hope you dig this video. Tony Rowe, out.